Okay, let's get started. So before I get into logic, a few announcements. Um, the exam is tomorrow. Uh, remember that. Um, next week is Thanksgiving break, so we won't have uh, any classes. There's no more sections. Um, and after you guys come back from Thanksgiving break, on the Monday, there's going to be a poster session um, from 2.30 to 5.30. So there's more details on the website, and we'll post more details on uh, Piazza as well. Um, and then finally, the day after, there is a logic um, homework due. Uh, so that's pretty much it, aside from the final report of things that you should keep track of um, in this class. Um, I want to take a few minutes to talk about Coda Lab Worksheets. So this is a platform that uh, we've been developing in our group to help um, help people do research in a more efficient and reproducible way. And the thing that's relevant for 221 is that um, you will get an opportunity to get extra credit by um, using Coda Lab Worksheets. And also, it provides additional uh, compute if you're uh, running low on that as well. Um, I want to give a quick demo to give you an idea of how this works. So if you go over to worksheets.co.org, you can register for an account. Um, I'm going to demo a kind of a newer interface that you're actually going to see on the website, um, just because that's what's going to be rolled out soon. Um, so let's create a, a worksheet, um, CS220 demo. Um, a worksheet is like a Jupyter notebook, if you are familiar with that. Um, and you can do things like um, write up uh, write text. So I'm going to run some sentiment classification. Um, and let me try to at least spell this correctly. Um, so let's suppose this the title is C21 Final Project. Okay, and then you can upload code or data. So I'm going to go ahead and upload um, the sentiment data set. Hopefully this Sounds familiar to some of you. Um, so, um, and then I'm also going to upload this text class.py, which is a source code. Um, so each of these uh, resources, data or code, is called a bundle in CodaLab. And you can look at the contents of this bundle. You can download it and, and so on. Um, it has a unique ID, which specifies forever the precise version of this uh, asset. Um, and now the, the interesting thing you can do with this right now is you can run commands. So Colab is pretty flexible. You can run basically any command you want. Um, you specify the dependencies um, that this command will need to rely on. And then you can type in whatever text class.py train polarity.train test polarity.test. Um, and then you hit confirm. You can also see over here, you can specify how much resources you want, whether you want GPUs, where you need to access the network, um, and so on. So this goes and creates um, a Docker image that's actually running, or Docker container that's actually running this command. And you can uh, visualize the standard output in kind of real time as the command is, is running. Um, and you can see the files that are generated. Um, so for example, one of these files is just a JSON file that has the test error in it. So suppose you wanted to um, visualize the, your experiments a little bit better, um, because this is kind of just the default information, how much, how big the bundle is, and so on. You can um, go, this is a little bit more advanced, but I want to show you how this works. You can define custom um, schema. So if you define a schema, which is uh, called run, you add, um, uh, it's just some fields. You can actually specify test error as a custom field. And you say, go to stats.json, read it out. And, and then now you use that table to um, the schema to define this table. Um, you can see this is the test error. Let me make this a little bit nicer and format it to um, three decimal places. OK, and then you can go and um, you can modify this command. Um, and you say rerun. Maybe I want to try some other parameters. Uh, this eta is the, um, the step size. Um, let's try some more. You can rerun this um, 0.2 and so on. Um, so you can fire a bunch of jobs. Um, and you can kind of monitor them. So this one's running. This one's created. And you can monitor kind of various statistics that you want. So this is generally a good way to um, just launch jobs and kind of you know, forget about it and keep, tr keep track of 
all these things. Um, so then you can say um, larger step sizes are uh, hurt accuracy or something. Um, so the idea behind a worksheet like in Jupyter is that you document your experiments as you go along. And so every asset, data, code, and bundles, uh, and the experiments are all kind of treated the same way so that you can go in here and um, six months later and you know exactly what command you ran to get this result and the exact dependencies, so there's kind of no question. So you should think about this as kind of a git for um, experiments. And if you go to the main side, uh, you can actually fire uh, some jobs with GPUs on them. They're, depending on how many people are using it, there might be a queue or might not. Um, so if you have uh, want some extra compute, that's a good way to go as well. Question? How much memory can you typically get? How much memory can you typically get? Um, so there's... Um, so one thing that uh, if you want to um, find out, uh, so it, it varies depending on what kind of, of risks are available, but if you type uh, any sort of command, like free, you can actually see the exact environment that your job is running. Um, so I think on, you can get like maybe, let's say 10 or 16 gigs of, of memory. Any other questions about this? So there's um, documentation here. And if there's any f issues that you run into, uh, file a GitHub request or email me or something. Piazza um, won't have the highest of, you know, you can post on Piazza too, but um, it'll be probably faster if you uh, uh, um, submit a GitHub issue because I'll go directly to the team that's working on this. Yeah. Uh, does this work only with Python? You can run any command you want. So you can C++, Java. Um, it's, it's, install, it's, uh, it's Julia or something. Yeah, you can run it on Julia. So the thing, when you do a run, um, you specify the Docker image, which is basically contains your environment. So if you have, uh, Julia probably has Docker images available. Um, we have a default one that has, um, I don't, I'm not sure if it has Julia, but it, um, but it has kind of the standard uh, Python, TensorFlow, PyTorch kind of libraries. Yeah? Uh, if you want to install some dependencies like Java from the international student? Yeah, so if you want to install some dependencies, um, there's two things you can do. You can build your own Docker image, which you know takes a little bit of work, but it's not too hard. Or you can, um, if you want to be lazy, you can just do pip install here in the command. And you, for that, you have to make sure you turn on network access so it can actually download uh, from PyPy. So can you have some like, requirements for the Yeah. Yeah, you can have the requirements file. Yeah. So does this support uh, pop-up windows? For example, if you want to start something during the middle of the run? Uh, does this support pop-up windows? No, this is more like a batch run. So the way there's... Um, there's several ways you can do this. There's, uh, you can actually expose um, like a port, so you can connect, if you're using TensorBoard or something, you can actually connect to your job on the fly. Or you can actually, there's a way to mount the contents of your bundle while it's running to a local disk, and you can run whatever scripts you want. But um, maybe I'll hold off further questions. You come talk to me afterwards if you're, uh, if you're interested and want to know more. Okay, just wanted to make that, uh, Clear that that thing is available. Um, go check it out. Um, OK, so back to uh, the topic that we've been t um, discussing. Um, so on last Wednesday, we introduced uh, logic. Um, and remember, there's three ingredients of a logic. Um, there's the syntax, which defines a set of valid formulas. For example, in propositional logic, it's rain and wet as a particular formula. So syntax, formulas are just um, symbols. Um, they have no intrinsic meaning to themselves. The way you define um, meaning is uh, by <coughs> specifying the semantics. So we talked about the interpretation function, which takes a formula and <coughs> uh, a model which represents the state of the world and returns uh, either true or false. And the way you should think more generally about a formula is that it carves out a set of models which are configurations of the world where the formula is true. So in this case, 
there are four possible models. Um, and rain and wet corresponds to this set of models, which are in um, red here, where it's raining and wet. And finally, we talked about inference rules, where if you have a knowledge base, which is a set of formulas, um, what new formulas can be you know, derived? So one important thing to remember is that these formulas are not meant to kind of replace the knowledge base. These are things which are derived, which could be very simple things as you, know, you might, you have a lot of knowledge about the world, but um, you might want on a, any given context, you might uh, know that it's, it's raining, which is, so F is much, generally much smaller um, than the knowledge base in terms of complexity. So for rain and wet, you can derive rain. Okay, so um, in general, we run inference. What does it mean to do logical inference? You have a knowledge base, and then you have a set of inference rules that you keep on churning and churning, and then you see if you produce W, uh, uh, sorry, uh, F. Um, so an example we saw last time was modus ponens, um, which says if you have wet and weekday, and wet and weekday implies traffic, then you can derive traffic. So the things on the top are called uh, premises, and the things on the bottom are called is the conclusion. And more generally, you have this a modus ponens inference rule. Um, so now the question is, what does this inference rule have to do with uh, semantics? Because th this is just symbol manipulation. You just you saw these symbols, you produce some other symbols. And in order to anchor this in semantics, um, we talked about um, soundness and completeness. So entailment is a property between uh, a relationship between a knowledge base and a formula which is given by um, the models, right? So the models of F have to be a superset of models of KB. That's the definition of entailment. And separately, we have uh, the notion of derivation, which is uh, symbol manipulation. You can derive F given a set of inference rules from KB. And um, Soundness means that the set of <coughs> formulas that you derive are always entailed. And completeness means that you can derive all the entailed formulas. So remember this uh, water glass analogy, where this set of things in the glass are uh, true uh, entailed formulas, and you want to you know, stay within the glass, but you don't want to spill over. So. So far, we've looked at propositional uh, logic, um, which is any legal combination of symbols, propositional symbols, and their connectives. Um, we also looked at a subset of that called propositional logic with horn clauses, where all the formulas look like this. You have and of a bunch of propositional symbols implies um, some other propositional symbol. And so there's a trade-off here. So we saw that propositional logic um, is not, if you use modus ponens in propositional logic, you're, you're going to be sound, but you're not going to com be complete. There are certain types of formulas you sh which you won't be able to derive. Um, so we could either restrict a propositional logic to only horn clauses, and we showed last time that this indeed is complete, um, or we can say we really want propositional logic, the full expressive power, and so instead we're going to do this thing called resolution, which we're going to talk about in this um, lecture. Okay, so this lecture has two parts. We're going to talk about resolution for propositional logic and then move on to first order logic. Yeah? Um, going back to the last slide, when it says that the version with horn clauses is complete, does it mean that anything we could represent with propositional logic and resolution we can still represent with horn clauses? Uh, so you're ta asking about this last statement, or? The last two together, are they effectively equivalent? Is anything I could do with the last one something I could do with the second to last one? Um, so is, the question is, is anything I can do with the last one anything I can do with the previous uh, second to last one? Um, so it depends on what you mean by do. So these are different uh, statements about expressive power and inference rules. Um, propositional logic subsumes propositional logic with only horn clauses. Um, so you could just say, I only care about propositional logic, but it turns out this is going to be exponential time and this is going to be linear time. So there's a trade-off there. Yeah? I guess I was going to ask, when you say complete, does that mean that 
complete? Are we like saying Turing complete or what kind of level of completeness are we? Uh, so what is uh, completeness? I'm using a very precise way to talk about uh, of a completeness of a logical system, um, a set of inference rules means that anything that is entailed by the semantics of propositional logic is uh, derivable via a set of rules. And this particular set of rules here is modus ponens uh, for this case and then resolution for this case. Yeah. So the completeness is really a property of resolution, uh, the inference rule with respect to a particular logic. Yeah. Any other questions? <coughs> OK, so let's dive into resolution now. So let's revisit horn clauses and try to grow them a little bit. Um, to do that, we're going to take this example horn clause, A implies C. And we're going to write it with disjunction for reasons that will become clear in, in a second. Um, I'm going to write uh, some of these identities on you know, the, uh, the board. Um, so these are things which are, um, hopefully, you, uh, you know. Um, I also wrote this last time. Um, this is just the, um, just true, I guess. Um, this is, uh, I want to say definition, but it's not really the definition because the definition is the, um, the, the interpretation function. But you can check the 2 by 2 truth table, and this is you know, true. Intuitively, um, P implies Q really just is the same as saying either P is false or Q is true. If P is false, then the kind of the, the hypothesis is false, so it's irrelevant what Q is. And if Q is true, then, um, then the whole statement is true. OK? Um, so what about this? A M and B implies C. So I can write it as not A or not B or C. So this invokes another um, identity, so, which is that if I have not of P um, <coughs> and Q, that's the same as not P or not Q. Okay, so, and there's also another version, which is P or Q negated is the same as P uh, not P and not Q. So what I'm doing intuitively is pushing this negation um, past the, the, the connective into the propositional symbols. And when I push it past uh, negation past and, it flips to an or. And when I push it past an or, it flips to an and. Okay? And hopefully you guys should be comfortable with this, because when you're doing programming and you're writing if statements, um, you should know about that. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good question. So the word is the order of operations. It's here it's A and B parentheses implies C. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so if you apply the second identity on the board here, you have A and B is not A or not B. And then you apply the, the first identity and that thing um, or C is, is the same thing over here. OK, so now I'm going to introduce some terminology. Um, first is a literal. So this is going to be either a propositional symbol or it's you know, negation. Um, there's a notion of a uh, clause, which is just a you know, disjunction of literals. So disjunction means or. So these things are all clauses. Um, and finally, there is um, a particular type of clause called a horn clause, um, which I introduced last time. But here I'm defining it in a kind of a different light here, which is clauses that have at most one positive literal. Okay, So um, in th these clauses, there is indeed only one uh, positive literal. So these are horn, horn clauses. If you remember from last time, if you have um, snow or traffic appearing on the right-hand side, then that has two positive uh, literals, which, is, which means it's not a horn clause. 
So now I can write modus ponens the following way. So A and A implies C, which can be written as a disjunction, um, allows me to derive C. And here is another intuition, which is that I'm kind of effectively canceling out A and not A, and I'm taking the, you know, the resulting things and putting them um, on the bottom. Okay. All right, so now let's uh, introduce the resolution rule. So general clauses could have any number of literals. So this is not a horn clause, but it is a clause. And um, the resolution rule for a particular, this particular example looks like this. So rain or snow, and if you have not um, snow or traffic, allows you to derive rain or traffic. Okay, so this is uh, not a <coughs> horn clause, right? Because I have uh, two positive literals. Um, and how do we intuitively understand what's going on? So you could say, okay, it's either rainy or snowing, and snow implies traffic. Which means that if it was it was if snowing, then I can get traffic. If it was not snowing, I still have rain here, so I can um, I can conclude it's either rainy or trafficking. So in general, the resolution rule looks like this. So you have a, a clause up here um, <coughs> with some p propositional symbol, and then you have a second clause with not p. And what you can do is you can cancel out p and not p. And then you can take everything else and then hook them up as a big uh, you know, clause. <coughs> okay. So this is a rule. I kind of sketchily argue that it's a reasonable thing to do. Um, but to really formally verify that, you have to check the soundness. And the way you do soundness, remember, how do you check soundness? You go back to the semantics and, of propositional logic, and you verify that that's consistent with what resolution is trying to do. So in this rule, you have rain or snow. The set of models of rain or snow is um, everything that's not white here. Um, the set of models of not snow or traffic is everything that's not white over here. And when you um, intersect them, you get the dark red. And th that, that represents your, um, where you think the state of the world is if you only have the, the premises. Um, and if you look at the models of the conclusion, rain or traffic, it's this green area. And you just have to check that um, what you derived is a superset of uh, what you know. And again, this might be a little bit counterintuitive, but you should think about knowledge as restriction. Knowledge means that you actually have pinpointed the state of the world to be smaller. So the fewer um, colored boxes you have, the more knowledge you have. <coughs> okay, so this is sound. Um, completeness is um, another a uh, much harder thing to check. Yeah, question? So you mentioned that we wanted to have a superset at the end, not a subset, but there's the two topmost row tiles uh, for snow alone or snow removed yeah. that, that are not there. Is that because we've eliminated snow? This is, uh, so why are these there? This is, so this, um, this square is only true in rain or snow. Um, this is only true in uh, not snow or traffic. But remember, the, the way to think about a knowledge base is that semantics is the intersection of all the for models of all the formulas. So when I've intersected the models of everything up here, I'm only left with the dark red. Yeah. Um, there's just one square in our final in the green cell that's not a part of the intersection, I'm sure. Uh, there's, well, there's two, these two. And we allow for those because of the fact that we are, that it's, our conclusion is rain or traffic. But I'm just sort of wondering when you're mentioning the superset versus subset, um, why then the other two squares up on the first row weren't included? Um, 
So let's see. Why are the ones up here not included? Because they're not part of the intersection. So is your question, why are these squares not part of the intersection? Um, so they're not, let me clarify. So if you only look at the premises up here, the set of models is this square, this square, this square, and this square. Then you look at the premises, uh, sorry, the conclusion, and you look at the models independently of the premises, and you get these six squares. Yeah, so this is the green is just derived from the, the green here. Got it. Okay. Yeah. That, that helps. Okay. Good. All right. So um, it turns out that resolution is also complete. And this is, you know, kind of the, the big result from the 60s that um, demonstrated that even a kind of a single rule can kind of rule all of propositional logic. Um, but you might say, wait a minute, wait a minute. Um, there's clearly things that this resolution um, rule doesn't work on because it only works on clauses. So what if you have, what if you have formulas that aren't clauses at all? Um, so there's a kind of this trick that we're going to um, do is that we're going to reduce all formulas to clauses. Okay? So another definition that is important here is um, CNF. So it stands for conjunctive normal form. So a CNF formula is just a conjunction of clauses. Okay? So here is an example of a CNF formula. Um, here's a clause, here's a clause, and you can join them. So it's important to remember that. Um, so just to refresh, this is a CNF formula. It's a conjunction of clauses. Each clause is a disjunction of literals, and each literal is either a propositional symbol or its negation. So or is on the inside, um, and is on the outside. And the one way to kind of make sure you remember that is a knowledge base, remember, is um, a set of formulas, but really it represents the conjunction of all those formulas, because you know all the facts in your um, knowledge base. And uh, so you can think about a CNF formula is just um, a knowledge base where each formula is a clause. OK, so we can actually take any formula in propositional logic, and we can convert it into equivalent CNF formula, which I'll show in the next slide. And once we've done that, then we can use resolution, um, and life is good. OK, so the conversion um, is going to be just a six-step procedure. Um, and uh, the, I mean, it's a little bit grungy, but um, but I just want to kind of highlight the the general you know intuition. So we have this formula. So this is not a CNF formula, but we're going to make it one. Okay. So the first thing we want to do is we want to remove all the symbols that aren't um, ands or ors or negation because those definitely don't show up in this uh, in a clause um, or CNF formula. So we can use the identity, the first identity on the board, to uh, convert implication into um, <coughs> um, an, a not and an or. Um, you do that for the inner guy here. Um, and now you only have symbols that you're supposed to have. Um, the second thing is that remember the order in which these connectives uh, is important for CNF. So negation is on the very inside. Negation is only allowed to touch a propositional symbol. Then you have um, or disjunction, on, and then you have and. So we want to change the order so that that is, is true. So first we want to push the negation all the way inside. Um, and this is using the De Morgan's law, so the first, uh, the second, and third identities on the board, um, and uh, so we push this inside, um, so that now all the negation is on the, the on the inside. Um, we can remove double negation. Um, you can check very easy to check that that's uh, valid. Um, and finally, so this is not a, a CNF formula. It might look like one, but it's not. Um, if you turn your head upside down, it actually looks like a CNF formula. Um, 
But the reason is that um, and is on the inside, but it really should be on the outside. And to fix that, you can actually distribute or over and, which allows you to say this is summer or bizar bizarre and not snow or bizarre. OK, so now this is a CNF formula. And then you're done. Um, this is a general set of rules. Just to recap, you eliminate bidirection implication implication to get the symbol inventory right. And then you move negation all the way to the inside. Um, and you eliminate any spurious negation that you don't need. And then you move any or from the outside to inside the, um, the, the and. So long story short, take any propositional logical formula. You can make it a CNF formula. So without loss of generality, we're just going to assume we have CNF formulas. <coughs> okay. Um, another place that CNF for, you might have seen CNF formulas uh, come up is when you're talking about, um, in theoretical computer science, when you're talking about 3SAT. Uh, 3SAT is a uh, a problem where you're given a CNF formula where every clause has three um, uh, symbols and three literals, and you're trying to determine if it's satisfiable. And we know that to be a, a very hard problem. OK, so, so now let's uh, talk about um, the resolution algorithm. Um, remember, there is a relationship between entailment and contradiction. So knowledge base entails f is the same as saying knowledge base is incompatible with not f. Like f really, really must hold. It's, it's impossible that not f you know, holds. Okay. So suppose we wanted to prove that um, f is derived from the knowledge base. Um, what we're going to do is this proof by contradiction strategy, where we're going to say insert not f into the knowledge base and see if we can derive a contradiction. Okay, so you add not f into the knowledge base, convert all the formulas into CNF, and then you keep on reapplying the resolution rules, and you uh, return entailment if you can derive false. Okay, so here's an example of what this looks like. So here's a knowledge base, and here's a particular formula, and you know, I want to know whether KB entails um, f or not. Okay, so you add it. Um, add not f into the knowledge base, so that's not c. And um, I'm going to convert this into a CNF. So that only affects the first formula here. Um, and then I'm going to repeatedly apply the resolution rule. So I can take this uh, clause. Resolution says allows me to cancel not a with a. I get b or c. And then I take b and not b, cancel it out, c. And I cancel out c. I mean, when you see c and not c, um, that's clearly a contradiction, and you can derive false. Which means that the knowledge base entails f in this particular example. Okay. This also maybe gives a little bit of intuition of the mysteries of defining the goal clause and horn clauses as deriving of, you know, blah, 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 and implies false um, because you can add um, something that you're trying to prove, and you can use modus ponens to see if you can derive false. And if you do derive false, then it's a, it's a contradiction. All right, so as I alluded to before, um, there's a time complexity difference between modus ponens and uh, resolution. So for modus ponens, each rule application adds only adds a clause with one propositional symbol. So imagine you have n propositional symbols. You can really only apply modus ponens n times. So that's a um, linear number of applications there. Whereas the thing with resolution is that you can add, a, each rule application can add a clause with many propositional symbols. And in the worst case, you can imagine any subset of the propositional symbols getting added. And this results in an exponential time algorithm. This should not be surprising, because we know that 3SAT uh, is you know, MP complete. 
So um, unless there was some magic here, there's, there's no way to kind of circumvent that. Yeah? So why is resolution, I'm, uh, and maybe I'm wrong on this, but why is it preferred? So the question is, why is resolution preferred? Um, so you could just uh, convert everything to CNF and check, uh, do backtracking search or whatever on CNF. Resolution turns out that it will have generalizations um, to first order logic, which um, model checking doesn't. Right. So so remember, there's two ways you can go about. You can um, do basically reduce things to CSPs, and then you can solve it, or you can try to use inference rules. So this inference rule doesn't. Um, as far as I know, people don't really use resolution in propositional logic, but in um, first order logic, you kind of have no choice. Could you distill, though, like, I'm thinking that when you see the modus ponens inference rule, it's kind of like everything getting distilled down to and relationships. Yeah. Like, sort of, NAND and NOR are the universal gates. And so I'm thinking that resolution is like a NOR reduction, and uh, modus ponens is a NAND reduction. So aren't the two, couldn't you convert from one to the other? Um, the question is whether the two are um, resolution looks like kind of like NAND. Um, th there's quite a bit of difference there. Maybe we could talk about it offline. Yeah. Um, okay, so summarize. There's two routes here. You can say I'm going to use propositional logic with horn clauses and be using modus ponens. This is fast, but it's less expressive. Or I can embrace the full complexity of a propositional logic and use resolution, and this is exponential time. It's slow, but it's more expressive. Yeah? So by less expressive, you mean it takes more symbols to represent the same like truth formula, or like there are things that can't be expressed in foreign classes that can be expressed in propositional logic? Right. What do I mean by expressive? I mean the, the latter, which is that there's simply some things you can't write down um, in, uh, in with using foreign clauses. Like you can't write down rain or snow at all. Any sort of branching or disjunction uh, you can't do in horn clauses. So in some applications, horn clauses actually turns out to be um, qu you know, quite an enough. Um, so these type of horn clauses show up in kind of programming languages where you're just, uh, you know, you see some premises and you're trying to um, derive some other quantities. So like in program analysis, this is actually quite useful and efficient. Um, OK, so let's move to first order logic. So what's wrong with propositional logic? I mean, it's already exponential time, so um, you know, it better be pretty good. Um, so remember, the point of logic is to, in general, from an AI perspective, is to be able to represent and reason with knowledge in the world. So there's a lot of things that um, we want to represent, but might be awkward in propositional logic. So here's an um, example. So Alice and Bob both know arithmetic. So how would you do this in propositional logic? Well, propositional logic is about propositions. So this has two propositions, um, which are statements, um, which are either true or false. Alice knows arithmetic, and Bob knows arithmetic. OK, fine. So what about all students know arithmetic? How would you represent that? Well, um, you probably do something like this, where you say, OK, if Al is a student, then Al is knows arithmetic. If Bob is a student, Bob knows arithmetic, and so on. Um, because all propositional logic can do is reason about statements. So what about this? This is Goldbach's conjecture. Every even integer greater than 2 is a sum of 2 primes. Um, so good luck with that. Um, you might have to write down all the integers, which uh, there are a lot of them. So. Propositional logic is clunky at best and not expressive at, in the worst. What's missing? Um, when we have knowledge in the, in the world, it's often more natural to think about there as being objects and predicates on these objects um, rather than just um, opaque propositions. So Alice knows arithmetic actually has more internal structure. It's not just a single proposition that has nothing to do with anything else. It has notions of Alice and knows and arithmetic in it. And finally, once you can decompose a proposition into parts, you can do fancy things with them. You can use quantifiers and variables. For example, all is a quantifier. 
that applies to each person, and we want to do that inference without enumerating over all the people or all the integers. Okay, so I'm going to talk about first order logic going through our plan of first talking about the syntax, then the semantics, and then inference rules. So I want to warm up with just um, some examples. I'm not going to do as rigorous of a treatment of first order logic as propositional logic because um, it gets more complicated and I just want to give you an idea of how it works. So Alice and Bob both know arithmetic. This is going to be represented as um, knows Alice arithmetic and knows Bob arithmetic. Okay? So this is a, there are some familiar symbols like and. And now the, proposi uh, the propositional symbols have been replaced with these more structured objects. And all students who know arithmetic gets mapped to this, where now I have this quantifier for all x, student of x implies knows x arithmetic. OK, so a bit more formally, so there's a bunch of definitions I'm going to uh, talk about. So first order logic. So um, in first order logic, there's two types of things. There's terms, and then there's formulas. In propositional logic, there are only formulas. So terms are th uh, expressions that refer to objects. So it could be a constant symbol. Um, it could be a variable, or it could be a function applied to some other terms. So for example, arithmetic is, a, is just a constant. It's an, you think about it as a name. Um, there are variables like x, um, which I'll explain later. Um, and there's function of terms. So 3 plus uh, x would be represented as sum of 3 and x. Okay. Remember, these are just symbols. Um, and uh, formulas refer to truth values. So there's atomic formulas, or atoms. Um, so this uh, atomic formula is a predicate applied to um, terms. So knows x is a term, arithmetic is a term, therefore a, a knows is a predicate. So knows x arithmetic is an atomic formula. Um, so atoms are supposed to be indivisible. But here, there's a substructure here. So maybe you can think about these as subatomic particles, if that, if that is useful. Um, there's a connectives, as before. So what we're doing right now is you're taking these atomic formulas, atoms, and they behave like propositional symbols. So given these atoms are generalizations of propositional symbols, we can string them together using any number of connectives, as we've done in propositional logic. And then finally, we have quantifiers applied to formulas, which means that if you have a formula with a variable in it, um, we can stick a quantifier over these variables to uh, specify how the variable is meant to be interpreted. OK, so you know, connectives um, and um, quantifiers. All right, so, so let's talk about quantifiers. Quantifiers are, in some sense, the, the heart of why first order logic is you know, useful. Um, there's two types of quantifiers, universal quantifiers and existential quantifiers. So universal quantifiers, you should think about as just glorified conjunction. So when I have for all x, p of x, that's really like saying p of a and p of b and p of c and for all the um, constant symbols. And existential quantifiers like glorified disjunction, when I say there exists x such that p of x holds, that's like saying p of a or p of b or and so on and so on. So I'm cheating a little bit because I'm only I'm still talking about the syntax of first order logic, but I can't resist but give you a little bit of intuition about what the syntax means. I'm not formally defining the the uh, interpretation function here, but I'm just trying to give you an idea of what the symbols um, correspond to. So here are some properties. Um, so if I push a negation through a universal quantification, then that goes on the inside, and 
the for all becomes and exists. Um, does this uh, sound familiar to people? What what is the name for this kind of thing? Yeah, it's just the Morgan's uh, law, but applied to first order logic as opposed to propositional logic. And it's really important to remember that um, the order of quantifiers matters, right? So for all exists is very different from exists for all. Okay, so um, one more comment about quantifiers. Um, it will be useful to be able to convert natural language sentences into uh, you know, first order logic. Um, and on the assignment, you're gonna do a bunch of this. But so this is kind of, uh, there's an important distinction I wanna make. So in natural language, you talk, have um, quantifiers in natural language are words like every or some or a. Uh. And so how do these get represented in, um, in uh, formal logic? Uh, every student knows arithmetic. Um, every generally refers to um, for all. So you might write something like this, but this is wrong. So what's wrong about this? Sorry, say again. Not every X, if, if you find an X that's not a student. Yeah, so, so the problem is that, what does this say? This is says, everyone's a student. For all X, X is a student. And for all X, um, X knows arithmetic. So it's basically saying everyone's a student and everyone knows arithmetic, which is different. So what it really should be is implication. So for anyone that's not a student, I don't, I don't care in terms of this uh, assessing the validity of this formula. And only if someone's a student, then I'm going to check whether that student knows arithmetic. OK, so what about existential quantification? Some new student knows arithmetic. This is student of x and knows x arithmetic. So notice the different connectives. And a general rule of thumb is that whenever you have universal quantification, it should be implication. And whenever you have existential quantification, it should be um, an and. So of course there is exceptions, but this is a this is a general rule. Okay, so let me give you a few examples just just to get you uh, used to think about quantifiers. So imagine you want to say there is some course that every student has taken. So what? How is that? So there ex there is some course. So there should be an exist. Um, why, why is a course that every student has taken? So every is a, for all x, and um, here I want student implies takes x, y. Okay, remember uh, exist has usually has and, and um, for all has implies. Okay, what about um, Goldbach's conjecture? Every integer is greater than, greater than 2 is sum of 2 primes. Um, this is every even integer, so every even integer greater than 2 implies that what about these? Um, this is a sum of 2 primes. So notice that there are no maybe explicit hints that you need to use existential, but the fact that these 2 primes are kind of underspecified means that um, um, it should be exist. So there exists y and z such that both of them are prime, and um, the sum of x, y and z is x. Um, and finally, Here's a statement. If a student takes a course and the course covers a concept, then the student knows that concept. Um, whether that's true or not um, is a different matter, but this is a valid formula, and it can be represented as follows. Um, so one other you know, piece of advice is that if you see word if, that generally suggests that there's a bunch of universal quantifications. Because if is kind of like saying there's a general rule and universal quantification says, like in general, you know, something happens. Um, so this is for all x, all y, all z. Um, if you have a student and takes some course, and that course covers um, some uh, concept uh, z, then um, that student knows that uh, concept. Um, I guess technically there should be uh, also and concept of z in there, but um, it's getting complicated. Okay, any questions about uh, 
first order logic, what the syntax is, and any of these intuitions and that we're having for it. Yeah. Just for uh, clarification, is there any reason why you don't use the equal sign instead of just equals, or is that just to find a predicate? Uh, so the question is, why don't we just use the equal sign? So I'm being a little bit, uh, uh, I guess, cautious in you know, following the strict syntax where you have functions that just take log. It gives you, it shows you the structure of the logical um, expressions more. So now, in, in certain cases, you you can use syntactic sugar and you can write equals if you want. Um, but remember, the point of logic is not to be able to write these things down manually and uh, reason with them, um, but to have a very kind of primitively built uh, system of formulas that you have general rules like resolution that can operate on them. OK, so let's talk about the semantics of first order logic. So in propositional logic, um, a model was something that maps propositional symbols to truth values. In other words, it's a complete assignment of truth values to propositional symbols. So what is this in first order logic? So uh, still, we're going to maintain the intuition that a model is supposed to represent a possible situation in the world. Um, so I'm going to give you a kind of some gra a graphical intuition. So imagine you only have unary and binary predicates. So these are um, predicates that only take one or two arguments. Then we can think about a model as being represented as a graph. So imagine you have. Um, Three nodes, these represent the objects in the world. So objects are kind of first class citizens in first order logic. And these are labeled with constant symbols. So you have Alice, you have um, Bob and Robert, and you have arithmetic here. And then the directed edges are going to represent binary uh, predicates. Um, and, and these are going to be labeled with the predicate symbols. Um, so here I have a nose predicate that applies to 0103, another nose predicate that applies to 0203, and a unary predicate here um, that applies to only 01. Okay. So more formally, a model in first order logic is a mapping that takes any, every constant symbol to um, an object. So Alice goes to 01, Bob goes to 02, Arithmetic goes to 03, and it maps predicate symbols to tuples of objects. So nose is a set of pairs such that the first element of the pair knows the second element of the pair. Um, I'm skipping function symbols just from simplicity, but you would define them analogously as well. Okay, so that is a, a model. It's a little bit more complicated than propositional logic because you have to define something for both. Um, the, ter uh, the, the constant symbols and the predicate symbols. So now, to make our lives a little bit easier, I'm going to introduce a restriction on a model. And it's motivated by the following example. So if I say John and Bob are students, um, then in your head you might imagine, well, there's two people, John and Bob, and they're both students. But there could be technically only one person whose name is both John and Bob, or someone who's anonymous and doesn't have a name. And there's two simplifications that rule out um, W2 and W3. So your unique names assumption says that object has most, each object has at most one constant symbol. And domain closure says that each symbol has at least one constant symbol. So the point of uh, this restriction means that constant symbols and objects are um, in one-to-one -one relationship. And once you do that, then we can do something called propositionalization. And in this case, a first-order logic is actually just a syntactic sugar for a propositional logic. Um, so if you have this knowledge base in first-order logic, um, student of Alice and Bob, student of Bob, um, for all, uh, all students are people, and there's some creative student, um, then you can actually convert very simply into propositional logic by kind of unrolling. Um, it's like unrolling your loops in, in some sense. Uh, so 
we just um, have student Alice implies person Alice, student Bob implies person Bob. And because there's a finite set of prop, uh, constant symbols, it's not going to be like an infinite um, set of formulas. There might be a lot of formulas, but um, it's not going to be an infinite set. Okay, so the point of doing this is now you can use any inference algorithm for propositional logic for first order logic. Okay, so if you're willing to make this uh, restriction, unique names and domain closure, that means you kind of have direct access to all the objects in, in the world via, via your um, constant symbols, in which case uh, you've, um, you're just propositional, you just have propositional logic. Okay, so why might you want to do this? Um, so first order logic as, as a syntactic trigger still might be convenient. You might still want to write down um, your expressions in first order logic um, and have the benefits of actually having um, you know, propositional logic where the inference is in some sense much more you know, developed. Um, but later we'll see that um, there's some cases where uh, you won't be able to you know, do this. Okay, so that's all I'm going to say about the semantics of uh, first order logic. Um, so now let's talk about inference rules. Okay, so I'm going to start by talking about first order logic with horn clauses, and we're going to use some generalization of modus ponens, and then we're going to move to full on first order logic and talk about the um, generalization of resolution. Okay, so um, let's begin by defining definite clauses for first order logic. So remember, a definite clause in propositional logic was a conjunction of propositional symbols implies some other propositional symbol. And now the propositional symbols are now these atoms, atomic formulas. And furthermore, we have, might have variables, so we're going to have um, uh, qua universal quantifiers on the outside. So intuitively, you should think about this uh, as a single template that gets real, if you were to propositionalize, it would be a, a whole s a set of definite formulas in propositional logic. So this, an, an, another way to think about this is that this single statement is a very compact way of writing down what would be very kind of cumbersome in uh, propositional logic because you would have to instantiate all the possible symbols. Okay, so here's a formal definition. So a definite clause has the following form. You start by a set, having a set of variables, which are all universally quantified, and then you have atomic formulas, which are all conjoined, it implies um, another atomic formula. And these atomic formulas can contain any of these variables. Okay? So now let's do modus ponens. So here's a straightforward generalization of modus ponens. Um, you have some atomic formulas, A1 through AK, that you pick up, and then you have A1 through AK implies B, and then you use that to derive B. Okay, so it says the first attempt, so you might, uh, so you might catch on to the fact that this actually won't work, so why doesn't it work? So imagine you have um, P of Alice, and then you have for all X, P of X implies Q of X, um, so the problem is that you can't actually infer Q of Alice at all because P of X here and P of Alice just don't match, right? This is supposed to be A1, this is supposed to be A1, and P of X and P of Alice are not the same A1. So this is kind of an important lesson because remember these inference rules don't know anything. They have no kind of intrinsic semantic, they're just pattern matching, right? So if you don't write your patterns right, then it's just not going to work. But we can fix this. And the solution involves two ideas, substitution and unification. So substitution is taking a formula, applying a, a find and replace to generate another formula. So if I want to replace x with Alice, apply to p of x, I get p of Alice. 
um, I can do two fine room replaces, um, x with Alice, x, y with z, and I'm going to replace x with Alice and uh, y with z. Um, and so in general, a substitution theta is some mapping from variables to terms. And substitution theta of f returns the result of just performing that substitution on f. So it generates another formula with these variables replaced with these terms. So pretty simple idea. OK, unification takes two formulas and tries to make them the same. And to make them the same, you have to do some substitution. So it returns what substitution it needed to do that. OK, so here's an example. Knows Alice arithmetic, knows x arithmetic. These expressions are not syntactically identical. But if I replace x with Alice, then they are identical. So that's what unification does. So what about this example? How do I make these two identical? I replace x with Alice and y with z. And what about this one? I can't do anything because I can't. I can only remember substitution only can replace variables with other things. I can't replace constant symbols. So I can't replace Alice with Bob. So that just fails. Um, and then uh, things can get a little bit co more complicated when you have functional symbols. So here, to make these the same, I need to replace x with Alice. And then y with f of x, but x has already been replaced with Alice. So I need to make this y goes to f of Alice. Okay, so to summarize, uh, summarize uh, unification takes two formulas, f and g, and returns a substitution, which maps uh, variables to terms. Um, and this is the most general unifier, which means that if I unify x and x, I could also replace x with Alice, and that would be fine, but that's not the most general thing. I want to substitute as l a little as possible to make two things um, equal. Um, so unify returns a substitution such that, and here's an important property, if I apply that substitution to f, I get identically the same expression as if I apply theta to g. And if I can't do it, then I just fail. OK, so now, yeah, question. Can we say that f of x, uh, like what should we say to f of x? Is it a variable or is it a formula? So. So the question is, f, f of x, is this a variable or a f, uh, formula? So f of x, f is a function uh, symbol. So it takes a term and returns a term. So the technical term f of x is a term, um, which represents an object in the world. Um, and you can check that um, nose is a, is a predicate. So it needs to take uh, terms. So f of x is a term. OK, so now with substitution and unification, we can now revise our modus ponens to make it work. So um, I'm going to have a1 prime through a k prime, which are distinct syntactically from a1 through a k. And what I'm going to do is try to unify the primes and the not primes into some substitution. And once I have the substitution, I can apply this to b um, and derive b prime, and that's what I'm going to uh, write down. OK? So let me do go through this example now. So suppose Alice has taken 221, and 221 covers MDPs. And I have this general rule that says if a student takes a course and the course covers topics, then that student knows that topic. Um, so I need to unify this. Uh, takes Alice 221, covers 221 MDP with this abstract version. And when I unify, I get um, the substitution to be x needs to be replaced with Alice, y with 221, and z with MDP. And um, then I can derive, uh, I'll, and then I take this uh, theta and I apply that substitution to knows xz. And I get um, knows Alice MDP. So intuitively, you can think about a one prime and through a k prime. These are concrete. This is concrete knowledge you have about the world. This is a general rule. So what the substitution 
does is it specifies how the general variables here are to be grounded in the concrete things that you're dealing with. And now um, this final substitution uh, grounds it out, grounds this part into um, the concrete symbols, in this case, Alice 221 and MDP. Okay, so what's the complexity of this? Um, so each application of modus ponens produces an atomic formula, just one, not multiple ones. So that, that's the good news. And if you don't have any function uh, symbols, um, the number of atomic uh, formulas is you know, most the number of constant symbols to the maximum predicate arity. So in this case, if you have like 100 possible values of x, 100 possible values of y, 100 possible values of z, that would be the number of possible um, formulas that you might produce is 100 to the third. So, um, you know, that, that could you can imagine this being um, a very, very large number. So it's exponential in the arity, but if the arity is, you know, let's say 2, then, you know, this is not too bad. It's not exponential. Um, so that's, that's the good news. The bad news from a complexity point of view is if there are function symbols, then actually um, it's infinite. Like it's not just exponential time, it's like infinite, um, infinite time. Because the number of possible formulas that you could produce is uh, kind of unbounded. And when might you have something like this? Well, if you remember, one of the functions could be sum. So you could have like sum 1 and sum of 1 and sum of 1 and, and so on. So you can kind of essentially encode arithmetic using this uh, first order logic. OK, so, so here's what we know. So modus ponens is complete for first order logic with only horn clauses. Right, so what does completeness mean? It means that anything that's actually true, that's entailed, there exists a derivation, a way of applying modus ponens to get there. But the bad news is that it's semi-decidable. Um, this means, uh, so first order logic, even when you restrict it to horn clauses, is semi-decidable. This means what? S if f is in entailed, forward inference um, using um, uh, uh, complete inference rules, in this case a modus ponens, will eventually prove or derive f in finite time because it's complete. So eventually you'll get it. But if, if it's not entailed, we don't know. We don't know when to stop because it could go just keep on going on and on. And actually no algorithm can uh, show this in finite time. So this is a complexity theoretic result that says um, it's not just exponential time, but it's actually there's no algorithm. It's like the, if you're familiar with the halting problem, that's, this is very related to that. OK, so that's a bummer. Um, but you know, it's, it's not the end of the world because you can still actually uh, just run um, uh, uh, inference and get a partial result. So you might succeed, in which you know for sure, because it's sound, that um, it's, uh, it, the f is entailed. And after a while, well, you just uh, run out of CPU time and you stop. And then you say, I don't know. OK, so now let's talk about resolution. So we've finished talking about first order logic with uh, restricted to horn clauses. And we saw that modus ponens is complete. Um, there's a small wrinkle that you, it, you can't actually compute everything that you hope for, but that's life. Um, and now we're going to um, go to resolution. Uh, so. Remember that first order logic includes non horn clauses. So here's an example. So this says all students know something. Um, and the fact that this is, it exists here 
Remember, existential quantification is like glorified disjunction. So this is like our example of no snow or traffic. Um, so what do we do with this? So we're going to follow the same strategy as what we did for propositional logic. We're going to convert everything into CNF, and then we're going to repeatedly apply the resolution rule. And the main thing that's going to be different is that we have to handle variables and quantifiers and use substitution and unification. But the structure is going to be the same. So the conversion to CNF is um, a bit um, messy and gross and slightly non-intuitive. Um, I just want to present it so you know what it looks like. Um, so here is a example of um, not a CNF formula. Um, so what does this say? Just you know, to practice, um, this says for all x, um, so if anyone who loves all animals um, is loved by someone. And what we want to produce is the final output is this CNF formula, which again, CNF means a conjunction of uh, disjuncts. And each disjunct is um, a atomic formula or a atomic formula that's been negated. Um, and here we see some uh, functions that have emerged called Skolong functions, which um, I'll explain later. Um, and that's, that's basically it. So we have to handle variables, um, and we're going to have to handle um, uh, somehow. And the way we do this is uh, we remember there's no quantifiers that show up here. And by default, everything is going to be universally quantified, which means that the existential quantifiers have to go away, and the existential quantifiers get converted into these uh, functions. Okay. All right. So, um, part one. Um, so there's a, again the six or I can't remember six to eight step procedure. We start with this input. What is the first thing we want to do? We want to remove all the symbols that don't shouldn't show up. Get our symbol inventory correct. So we eliminate implication. Um, this is the same as you know before. So here is this thing implies uh, this thing, and we re replace that with not that the first thing or not the second thing. So now the expressions are more gross, but it's really the same uh, rule that we identity that we were invoking before. Um, we do that for the inner uh, expression. We push the um, negation inwards, so it touches the atomic formulas um, and eliminate double negation. So this is all in old news. Um, and something new here is we're going to standardize the variables. So this step is technically not necessary. By standardizing variables, I just mean that you know this y and this y are actually different. It's like having two local variables and two you know different functions. They have nothing to do with each other. Because we're going to remove quantification later, I'm just going to make them separate. So this y gets replaced with a z. OK, so now I have this. Um, I'm going to replace existentially quantified variables with column functions. OK, so this requires a little bit of explanation. So I have exist z loves z of x. Okay. And this existential is on the inside um, here. So um, of, of this uh, universal quantifier fire. So in a way, z depends on x. For every x, I might have a different z. So to capture this dependency, I can't just drop um, exist z. What I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, capture the dependency by turning z into a function. Um, and the same thing happens over here. I have exists y, and I replace this lowercase y with a, f a big Y that depends on the, the variables um, that are universally quantified um, outside this, the scope here. Yeah? Doesn't it love all animals, not just one animal? Um, so th loves all animals is on the, in the 
I guess the first part. So everyone who likes all animals is loved by someone. So this is the someone part. Um, because here I push the negation inside. Yeah. Yeah. So remember when I push negation f past the for all, it becomes it exists. Okay. So now um, I can d distribute or over and to change the order of the of these connectives so that because in CNF I want a conjunction of disjuncts, not a disjunction of conjuncts. Um, and finally, I just ditch all the universal quantifiers. Okay. Okay. So um, I don't expect you to, you know, follow all that in complete detail, but this is just giving you a basic idea. Okay. So now we're ready to state the the resolution rule, and this should look very familiar. It's the same resolution rule as before, but now all of these things are not propositional symbols, but atomic formula. And now this is not P and not P, uh, but P and not Q, and I because these in general might be different, and I need to unify them. Um, and then I would th take the substitution returned by unification, and I'm going to apply it on the result, it's the same way we did for modus ponens. So here's an example of this: I have um, animal or loves, and over here I have not loves or feeds. Um, and what do I do? I uh, try to unify this loves with this not loves, and I get this substitution. So u has to replace with uh, z of x and v with uh, x, um, and that allows me to cancel these now. Now I've made them equal, um, and now I take the remaining parts and I apply the substitution. So this feeds u of v becomes feeds um, z of x and x. Okay, so there's a bit more intuition I could provide, but this does become a little bit abstract, and you just kind of have to trust that resolution is uh, doing its job. I personally find it kind of difficult to look at intermediate stages of logical inference and really get any intuition about the individual pieces. But, but that's why you define the principles, prove that they're right, and then you trust that logical inference does the right thing. Okay, to summarize, um, we've talked about propositional logic and first order logic. So for inference in propositional logic, you could just do model checking, which means that convert it to a CSP and solve it. Um, in first order logic, um, there's no way to enumerate all of the possible infinite models, so you can't do that. But in certain cases, you can propositionalize, um, and you can reduce first order logic to propositional logic in certain cases. Or you can stick with inference rules. And if you stick with inference rules, you can use modus ponens um, on the horn clauses. Or you can, um, if you don't want to restrict to horn clauses, you can use uh, resolution. And the only thing that's different about first order logic here is a plus plus, which means that you have to use unification um, and substitution. Okay, um, final takeaway is. You know, there's a lot of kind of uh, symbol manipulation and details here, but I wanted to kind of stress the importance of logic as uh, expressive language to represent knowledge and reason with it. And the key idea in first order logic is the use of variables. So these are n very not the same uh, set of, uh, notion of variables as in um, in CSPs. Those variables are propositional symbols, which are like the simplest thing in logic. So in logic, first order logic, we've kind of gone up a kind of a layer in the uh, expressive hierarchy and variables here allow you to um, you know, uh, give compact representations to a very um, you know, rich thing. So again, the kind of a, if you don't remember anything, just remember the takeaway that logic allows you to express very complicated and big things using kind of small formulas. Okay, so that's it. Um, the, on Wednesday, we'll be giving a lecture on uh, deep learning, and um, there's one, and then we have the poster session after uh, Thanksgiving, and then the final lecture that we'll give that will sum everything up. So, okay.
I will see you at the poster session, and good luck on the exam.